Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for um, having me here in Vienna tonight. Um, thank you to Rainer for the invite. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, so I've been using the EMV lens for quite a while now, and, uh, and it's a lens that's actually quite close to my heart because the idea for it originally came from my, um, my fellowship mentor, Graham Barrett. So, um, so it's really great to be involved with it and, uh, and have the opportunity to discuss it with you all this evening. Uh, these are my disclosures. So <clears throat> to really, is that coming up all right? Yeah. To really understand why the EMV lens is a useful addition to our armory when it comes to presbyopia treatment, it's worth reminding ourselves of what are the, fun what are, what are the requirements of good functional vision. So good functional vision requires acuity at near, intermediate and far distance. And as cataract surgeons, we're all very familiar with targeting emetropia and then telling our patients that they're likely to need glasses for reading. But we often neglect or forget to mention the intermediate distance. So that's approximately arm's length. And in, in the modern world, that's a really crucial distance because that, that's what you need for things like seeing your computer screen, the dashboard in your car, your dinner plate, um, shelves in shops. So if we, if, if, we, if we neglect that and if we fail to provide that for patients, then it's, it's a source of dissatisfaction. So to successfully manage presbyopia, we really have to achieve good vision at all three distances. So if we looked a bit like this, then that would be very straightforward because we could set one eye for distance, one for intermediate and one for near. But unfortunately, we're more like this. We've only got two eyes. And because of that requirement for good vision at three ranges, we have to try and get all three focal ranges out of just the two eyes. And there are a variety of ways to achieve this, but each comes with some form of compromise. So it's really then a case of working out which compromise is best for the patient in front of you. And if there's no cataract, then all these options are available. And there are obviously pros and cons to each. And once there's a cataract, then our options are limited to what we can do with intraocular lenses, either with a monovision strategy or multifocal implants or balanced vision using monofocals and then wearing glasses afterwards. And the compromise that I'm talking about is really between achieving spectacle freedom at all distances versus preserving the maximum quality of vision. And the, the holy grail, so to speak, is to achieve both of those. Now this graph shows roughly where the different options lie. It's very crude. Um, trifocal lenses are fantastic at providing spectacle freedom at all ranges. Um, but as Prof Amon has, has touched on, they, they do affect visual quality. Some patients struggle with glare and dysphotopsia and, and halos particularly. And at the other end of the spectrum, wearing glasses provides very good vision, but very little spectacle freedom. Monovision occupies the middle ground and it can provide a better visual quality than multifocal lenses would and it can reduce the need for glasses, but most people will still require glasses for small print. And the disparity between the eyes can also be a source of problems with binocularity and, and stereopsis. So at this point, I'll just give a brief overview of the history of monovision. So traditional monovision employed an offset of around 2.5 to 3 diopters between the eyes. And this provided great monocular vision for distance and for near, but with no intermediate vision. So there was this large blur zone between the two eyes. And this, this is an image from, um, from Carl Zeiss, which, which I think is, is useful. Um, and there are significant issues with binocularity and stereopsis and visual quality. So for those reasons, traditional monovision got a bit of a bad reputation um, and, and, it, and it didn't gain much popularity. So for those reasons, over the last few years, we've been moving more towards smaller myopic offsets. And these, so that there's, there's micro or mini monovision, which is around a, a half diopter offset between the eyes. Um, and then there's modest or modified monovision, which is about 1.25 diopters. And these smaller offsets certainly improve the quality of vision 
and give back that intermediate focus, but at the expense of the unaided reading vision. So Professor Barrett first described his approach to modest monovision back in 2008, in which he uses an offset of around 1.25 diopters. And this is generally very well tolerated by patients to the point that no contact lens trial is needed beforehand. We don't really need to worry about ocular dominance testing, but most patients still require reading glasses. So you have to counsel them on that. And, and again, we're, we're, it's another compromise. We have to emphasize to patients that they're, they're not going to be completely spectacle free, mostly. So how can we push modest monovision from the middle ground up towards the top right of this graph, improving visual quality, but also achieving more spectacle freedom? So the key to this is spherical aberration. And spherical aberration is where light rays passing through the periphery of a lens are refracted differently to those at the center. Now, technically, spherical aberration leads to a blurred image. And this is why many manufacturers over the years have been trying to minimize spherical aberration with different aspheric lens designs. But while reducing aberrations to zero it gives a perfect image, there's also no depth of focus. And this is quite an unnatural situation. All eyes have aberrations. Um, and as long as they're within certain limits, neural processing acts to enable both quality of vision and gives that depth of focus. If you've got too much spherical aberration, then it can become toxic and start to affect the quality of vision, but just the right amount can be beneficial. So harnessing spherical aberration and, and finding the sweet spot seems to be the, the key to how we can um, advance monovision to be a better solution. So Dan Reinstein um, is, you've probably all heard of Dan, he's one of the, the world's top refractive surgeons in terms of laser eye surgery, and he's done a lot of work over the last decade or so exploring how spherical aberration can be used to enhance the effect of LASIK monovision and transform it into what he calls laser blended vision. Now this has led to the development of Presbyond um, from Zeiss, and this is essentially modest monovision with LASIK augmented with the controlled induction of spherical aberration. So this enhances the near vision of the myopic eye. So even with a prescription of just minus 1.5, good reading vision is achieved. And it also helps to extend the depth of focus in the distance eye. So this helps turn the, the blur zone that you saw in a previous slide into more of a blend zone. The eyes are, are, are blended together more naturally. Um, so this provides a more continuous range of vision without the patient having noticeable gaps. And the EMV takes this concept of laser blended vision and achieves it with intraocular lenses. So the, the Ray-1 EMV is designed to have positive spherical aberration. So once again, this increases the depth of focus in the distance eye, enhances the near vision of the myopic eye, and the blur zone between the two is turned into a blend zone. And because there's no multifocality, there's no diffractive, no, no diffractive rings um, with this lens, good visual quality is maintained. So the idea with EMV um, is to use a similar modest monovision offset of around 1 to 1.25 diopters. And you can see here at the bottom that by targeting just minus 1 in the non-dominant eye, near focus at around 44 centimeters can be achieved. So that's an effective range binocularly of 2.25 diopters. But the, the interesting thing with this lens is that with smaller offsets or even with bilateral emetropia, a substantial range of vision can be achieved. Um, so even bilateral emetropes who don't particularly uh, want monovision or who aren't deemed to be suitable for monovision can achieve good intermediate vision, which as we know can be very useful, at around 80 centimeters. And this has certainly been reflected in my experiences with this lens so far that the majority of my patients um, who I've targeted emetropia have achieved around N8 to N10 at 80 centimeters, which is useful for that arm's length vision and for, for large print tasks. Um, so really this, this does start to make diffractive lens technology almost a bit redundant because you're achieving that kind of range without, without any risk of, of halos. So to conclude, um, in my opinion, the EMV really is a big step up towards the, the holy grail of, of presbyopia treatment. 
um, increasing spectacle freedom at all distances while preserving the maximum visual quality. Um, so thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions at this stage. Thank you.